Hello, and welcome to the Momentum Ministry Partners podcast. This podcast is designed to provide that momentum in our God-given roles of leadership as we partner together to equip today's Christian leaders for tomorrow's opportunities. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome back to another Momentum Ministry Partners podcast. I'm Eric Miller. I'll be your host, and we have back with us Woo-hoo. Jeffrey Bogue. Back with you. Back. I You're back. back. I've come back from my world tour, and now I'm sitting here Ooh, with you. I'm intrigued. What was your world well, tour? I went, I'll take I the went bait. to Chipotle. <laughs> I went to a sushi place. <laughs> We had a lunch at a Mexican restaurant, and now I'm back. There you go. All right. That's a lot of lunches. <laughs> Is that all today or this week? Well, you know, I've been gaining weight. <laughs> oh, my. Those those would be good mistakes to make, Jeff, if you ate all of that for lunch mm. in one day. Yeah. We are talking about mistakes today, so oh, I was, I was going to ask you. I you did there. That was tricky. I was going to ask you, what what's a, a common mistake that you have made over the course of your life? Oh, a common one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go first because I've given okay. this a lot of thought. All right. I speed. You speed. <laughs> you do speed. <laughs> you do I speed. Have a, I have a... And I'm, maybe that's not a mistake. I don't, think, yeah, I don't think that's a mistake. I think that's a rebellion. Like a mistake is like I didn't uh, mean to do it. I, I've ridden with you. So when I get pulled over, it's usually, oh, I'm so sorry, officer. That's my mistake. That's yeah. my go-to line. Yeah. I still get tickets, though. No, you are straight up rebel. <laughs> you should be in prison for your... <laughs> Speeding offenses. Oh, we're not talking about those kind of mistakes, though, I oh, guess, okay. today. Yeah. <laughs> My mistakes are going to... I will I will miss things. Like the... Um, I'll miss a clue or I'll miss like a social thing. And my wife or my daughter usually are the the one that has to like tie me into it. But I'm like, uh, what are you guys... What's, what are they talking about? Yeah. I do that kind of stuff. Now, I also do rebellious, sinful things, <laughs> which is what you're talking about. <laughs> But I just don't Fair. downplay them as mistakes in my life. <laughs> you just own them and call them what they actually that's are. Right. Okay, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, then Oops, that's an accidentally sped. Well, then I have Eric, another mistake. Eric Miller has never accidentally sped. <laughs> then I have another mistake to add to the he list. He has found the uh, performance limits of a Honda Odyssey minivan. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, man. They do well on two wheels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knew they handled the way that they do? Jeff, I think it's funny because the other, like you're talking about the the like missing clues. I, as a youth pastor, I would often say to a student like, "Hey, how's it going? Like, you still dating that girl?" And they'd be like, "We broke up like a month ago." Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, it was awful. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. That's the stuff. I, I <laughs> like. I do. I don't retain stat stuff. For it's some so hard reason. to keep and, up with. It's hard to keep up with, and then my brain is just not wired to hang on to a detail, and so yeah, I'll, I'll forget that I did your wedding <laughs> or your funeral or you know those kind of things. And people just <laughs> like our my church just has to be abundantly gracious. Then they are. They're like, yeah, he he's like he loves us, but he's terrible at remembering uh, who we are and what our needs are in life. <laughs> That's funny. Hi, Jeff. My name's. Heidi and I'm your wife. Yeah, it kind of works that way. That's sometimes. awesome. Well, today we're we're talking about mistakes that parents make with social media, and and our goal really in this conversation is to help parents navigate the the ever changing world of social media. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately, we want to remind parents that you're the parents. Yeah. That you're in charge. But we also want to help pastors kind of come alongside of of parents and families in these situations. Uh, from a church leadership standpoint, uh, to understand how to have healthy communication and implement a strategy around this, which is something I know we've we've both done many times, uh, and that's changed even through the years as social media changes, as new apps are being developed, as um, the internet continues to grow and change. Yeah. So, Jeff, as you even look back over the last, I don't know, decade or so. Uh, and you've seen the impact of social media on the family, on individuals, uh, as the pendulum has shifted uh, from being a, a non-internet world and doing ministry where like families still actually ate dinner most nights yeah. to now they're like, you go to a restaurant and you see every family uh, on a device. Mm-hmm. They're not even talking to each other. It's crazy. Like, how have you seen that impact uh, and and what what are some talk about some of the the cultural shifts that have happened in that? You know, it's interesting that that 
whole shift. So I, I am old enough that um, I remember, say, like 1990, the 1990s when the mm-hmm. internet really came online, and then like 2005, eight when smartphones really became a thing. Yeah. And so kind of have got to live through that revolution. And so, you know, there's this term that there are digital uh, pioneers and then there are people who are digital natives. Yeah. So I would be um, kind of in that digital pioneer world, like uh, have embraced technology. I'm not a techie guy, but I like the conveniences of technology and kind of see the upsides. What fascinates me with my my children's generation is their digital natives. They think mm-hmm. technology, and they their instinct is technology. And so, I think as a as a parent who's parenting those children, and then some many of our parents who would listen to this are younger than me, so they're closer to that native maybe than I am. Um, I think the what's fascinating is there's some real upsides and some real downsides, obviously. So yeah. the, the, uh, the idea of like, I'm going to buy my 13 year old a phone used to be like mortify people until you have an active 13 year old right? and you can text them in school and they can let you know at their friend's house and you right. can have access to what you want. And so like, uh, people are like, Jeff, you buy your 13 year old phone. I'm like, Oh yeah. Cause it's for my convenience. And, and I feel safer when they when they have it. Mm-hmm. And I also would say that if I'm gonna if I'm gonna hand my child a dangerous tool, I want to be with them as they learn to to use it. So it's just different. Yep. Like um, it is nice. Uh, like our family has a text thread, and it's nice to kind of talk to each other all day, every day, and mm-hmm. and know what's around. Um, you know, and then the when the kids start driving, the fine you know you're able to track them, all those kind of things. So there's definitely some like upsides, and then it's a it's a downside. So the way that I would say this is, I would say the 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 phone, social media, is a tool, but it's a dangerous tool, and and it's like teaching your kids to drive. Um, the leading cause of death in teenagers in North America is car accidents but they have to learn to drive. And so you're putting them into something that they have to have, Mm. but it's dangerous. So what you do is you approach that systematically. Um, We're gonna drive together, you're gonna get your temps, I'm gonna send you to driver's ed, Uh, you have to be home before 11 o'clock when Mm. you get there. We we put a structure around it because we know how dangerous the car is. Uh, You can't load it up with your friends, et cetera. That structure is usually missing with social media. And and I, I say social media, and then I'll just say the phone. Yep. Because probably the one of the most dangerous things about the phone is pornography, and that's not usually social media right. driven. So I, I think educating, talking to, laying down a foundation of thought with our kids about what social media is, what technology, what the phone is, um, is important. So, like the hot thing right now is, uh, uh, you know, AI, artificial intelligence. So, Chat GPT came out. So, instead of looking and saying AI is going to take over the worlds, and we knew ter- we knew Terminator was, you know, <laughs> the Matrix was a view of the future. Instead of saying that, looking and saying, um, "Hey, kids, let's talk about the ethics and the integrity of using AI to write your papers." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because that's where that's actually going to show up in, right. their, in their life, where you can be a very lazy person mm-hmm. and you can be a very unethical person because something has been made so easy for you. Yep. So how do we use AI while being a hardworking person, while being an ethical person? Mm-hmm. Um, that's just the advance of technology. Uh, when I was in college... Uh, in the 90s, like the early 90s, I had to learn Greek mm-hmm. and I had to parse it. Well, what a dumb thing to do now right. when you can just ask the internet. Yeah. So like there's dumb things, like it's silly to do certain things when you can tell AI to do it for you. Right. But there's an ethical barrier and, mm-hmm. and that's that should be the conversation of a surrounding social media and surrounding technology. Yep. 
Yeah, Jeff, I mean, keep going down that path a little bit. Like, the, the what does the future hold as you project? AI is certainly a big part of that. Um, we've talked a little bit of some of the, the things that we're seeing, like high school students right now. There, there are some high school students who they're like, they're boycotting social media yep. because they're seeing the stats and they're seeing the effects of that. Like, are there other things that you see kind of playing into that too, to project it's an interesting thing um when COVID hit a few years ago it shoved technology down everybody's throat which caused us to rapidly find the relational limits of it Mm -hmm. and um as a church you know i pastor a, a, a church in ohio as a church we turned to technology to try to keep our people connected which was a phenomenal thing that we could go to the internet, we could broadcast, we could do Zoom, all those kind of things. The people who connected with it the least were the younger people. Yep. Because what they've done natively is they have integrated their social media into their relationships. So they don't see social media as something that they do, they see it as an extension of who they are. Mm-hmm. And that's why you'll see uh, young people, uh, and now old people do it too, Mm -hmm. will sit together in a room, enjoy each other's company while we show each other videos or TikToks. We're Mm -hmm. like, watch this, watch this, then we'll laugh about it. It's just integrated into our social relationships. What, What COVID did was it found the limits of that, and then there's been a backlash of saying, I do not want dis- digital relationships. I want to like be in a room with people and have yep. real conversations. So like we have a phrase around, I don't know if it's a national phrase or what, are, or I don't even know where these things come from, but like uh, phones down, friends up. Like my, and our phones down, family up. My kids, if Heidi and I are on the phone when we're together, they're like, put your phone down and pay attention to us. Yep. So so it ba- it's balancing out because it's, they would look and say, in any relational setting, if one thing is pushed too far in a, in a relational context, it, it, it's unhealthy. So if I, have a re- if I have a friendship and all we ever do is have the deepest of talks, it's exhausting. It also, if I have a friendship, all we ever do is goof around and never actually talk about what we think and feel. <laughs> right. It's exhausting. So it's like that. Like yep. if, if everything's digital, it doesn't work. Yep. But the idea that digital is going to somehow be at the periphery of your life is a, is a crazy, yeah. it's, a, it's a foolish idea. Yeah. So I think the younger generations know that where they're pulling off of social media is mm. it's them saying, yeah, it's it that's gone too far for me. Yep. And I don't want anything to do it. Do with it. Now what's going to happen is as they grow and get into the marketplace, you can't hardly exist in the marketplace without social media. So I don't I actually don't like social media that much because um, it mostly discourages me. I tell pastors all the time, if you want to be really depressed and feel really defeated, go watch your people on social media and see what they're really like. like yeah. I, it just wears me out, right? Yep. So so I do it more professionally because yeah. I realize that you have to exist in that world. Um, and it is not a optional world. It is a part of the real world. Um, and so I think that balance is coming in there. Mm-hmm. Now you have kids that are like, out of balance, like they're addicted to you know to to the gram, and so they'll scroll for hours. Yep. You have you have people who are out of balance. They're addicted to the comments and the likes. Those people are miserable. The people in the middle um, can tend to separate it a mm-hmm. little a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And I would say somewhere in there is the healthy thing. Yeah. So I, but I think the conversation shouldn't be. You look at Instagram too much. I think the conversation should be deeper. Right. So the conversation is um, when you're addicted to your Instagram account and likes and comments, you're actually making an idol of yourself. And then that's where the – because the Scripture isn't going to say, thou shalt spend an hour on Instagram. Right. The Scripture is going to say, don't idolize yourself. And social media – in an unhealthy context, is a pure mm-hmm. reflection and elevation of self. Mm-hmm. So you you deal with the core issue, 
and then you walk people through how to make that a, a, a um, uh, how that plays out in real time, yeah. like on on the phone. So, like the TikTok is or whatever, you know, is the same thing. Um, it's like if you spend hours and hours, which I I actually am prone to do. I have to be careful because I mm-hmm. think a lot of that stuff's funny, mm-hmm. and so I have to be careful. I'm like, all of a sudden, two hours. I'm like, I just wasted my night. I wasted my opportunity to have a, a good night's sleep. So that's not social media. That's actually entertainment is out of control in my life. Yep. And um, I have it's no that's no addicted uh, no different than dad being addicted to the golf league. Yep. Or mom being addicted to hanging out with her friends and and mm-hmm. drinking wine every night. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. see, what I'm saying so. There, yeah. There's underlying core spiritual human things that are the real conversation. Mm-hmm. That when you interact with your kids there it makes these other things balanced out yeah. and and healthy that's good i like i like the like learning to drive and the car analogy the car is a dangerous tool so we need to learn how to use it with caution and appropriately and there's parameters and and a, a set of skills that you need to learn in order to like earn trust and earn you know the the freedom that you want with it that principle when applied to this i think is so very helpful and oftentimes i think what we're seeing now and and part of this is like you're referring to those younger parents the like the parents that are 20s in their 20s and 30s right now where they did grow up with this they are in a sense digital natives and they don't under they don't even see how much time or the effect that their device or their time on social media is is hindering those relationships with their kids because their kids are little i'm kind of in that category right now a little bit my my i have a four and a six year old and i can tell you the number of times where i pick up my computer or my phone they act out like i see it without fail and and so they're trying to get my attention the the families that have older kids they're their students or their children are like, oh, wow, you know, dad's on his iPad again, not paying attention. And I guess we're not going to have a, a meaningful conversation right now. So like to be aware of those kinds of pieces is is a big deal. Jeff, as you look at just the the landscape of, of parenting, what are some of the other mistakes maybe that parents are making uh, or areas that we maybe miss in terms of setting healthy boundaries and needs for social media with our kids, I um, I think it's I think it's not being proactive. So, for instance, mm-hmm. I would not let if I could go back. How about I do it this way? If I could go back, I would not let my kids go to bed with their phones. Mm-hmm. Um, I would put a charging station in the kitchen and say, "You leave your phone there at night." Most of the temptation, most of the wasted time, most of the like, uh, all snap. It's one o'clock in the morning. I gotta go. Like happens there. Right. When your phone becomes your flashlight, when it becomes your <laughs> alarm clock. By the way, mine does too. I I go to sleep every night listening to audio books. Like I, the thing is with me twenty four. It's laying right here. I walked in here and laid yep. you know, because it is a tool. I would say. Let's go down to you know Walmart and buy an old fashioned alarm clock and and change that. Now, as an adult, think of the car. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm 16, I've had my license for two days. Dad, can I drive to Chicago and watch the Bulls play? No, that's a different conversation when I'm 21. Right, and I've been on the road for a while. So, right, that that is a thing. I think the other thing I would say is this. I think harping on an aspect of technology and social media as opposed to discipling and principles. You you can get as uptight as you want about TikTok. Mm -hmm. It's going to, that conversation is irrelevant in five years. Mm -hmm. Something else will take its place, probably already has, and you will never know about it. So the idea, technology, one of the reasons why uh, this stuff is dangerous is because you can be sneaky and actually get away with it, Mm -hmm. which is really the porn conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, um, when I was a a teenager, if I wanted to look at porn, I had to get a magazine or a videotape. I had to hide it. I had to, you know, now you just have to know how to erase stuff on your history. Nobody knows. Right. You know, so like 
creating some barriers where those temptations are going to be the strongest, mm-hmm. right? And then, um, and then realizing like you're not going to like even filters. Your kids are you're not going to beat your kids with filters on your internet, right? You're going to protect your little kids. Yeah, a teenager, they're going they're going to beat you on out. that every time. Yeah. So having the real conversation, um, being proactive in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Asking your kids about their struggle with porn, not shaming them. Um, having, I, I would definitely put myself on my kids' accounts, but they'll just, if they want to sneak around you, they'll just make shadow accounts. Right. Like you'll never know. Um, but like, I would do those kind of things. The older they get, the less effective they are. You have to go to that relationship because when my kid is in the car, if they want to drive that car 100 miles an hour, I cannot stop them and i won't know unless right. there's a an accident right so i have to be able to trust their character in mm-hmm. there and then i have to proactively speak into that character yeah and then i think there's a warning like one of the things i um i've tried to try to teach my kids is that social media is actually reflective of your character mm. So it's not that that's you see this a lot like what people do on social media they would never do in real life what they say on social <laughs> media they would never say in real life like is it is actually an extension of your relationships um, the other thing I try to say I try to teach them is like social media is permanent mm. so that picture you put up of yourself this happens all every yep. presidential election every time somebody wants to smear a celebrity they find them being a picture of them being an idiot when they were twenty yep. Like it's permanent, and then it's global. Mm-hmm. And I had to teach my kids this. Uh, I remember I we go on family vacation, and I like to goof off. So I'll goof off and do stuff, you know, nothing inappropriate, just like dumb stuff on family vacation. And I'll tell my kids. One time I I, I did this, uh, and my kids took a picture of it. I mean, goofing off, I turned around, I said, you cannot, you have to erase that picture right now. And they're like, why? I said, do not post it. Like, dad, they they thought I was uptight. I was like, honey, Mm -hmm. um, right now, my friends in Central Africa, some of them are being taken from their homes and killed by Muslim extremists. They do not need to see me goofing Goofing off in this way right now. Right. It's global. Yeah. And and so like just little things like that mm-hmm. like it you wouldn't think about it because it's an extension of yourself and your relationships. Most kids think that social media is like sitting here like it just it's kind of in the room and it's funny. Well, it's not. Right. And it's it. I am I am so grateful mm-hmm. that my high school and early college years are not permanently documented. Be, because I'm not that person. Right. Right. But it gets thrown back at you. So just yeah. those kind of conversations are mm. huge. I think if you're if you're looking for the filter, if you're looking for the control, if you're looking for I'm not yeah. my kids not getting a phone until they're eighteen. Like I'm like I I mm. don't recommend it. I I I do think like your kids are little. You should have filters because they can stumble into stuff. Yep. But when they're fifteen, they'll find wherever they want to find. Yeah. And and they'll learn that from their yeah. friends. So now we're really dealing with their character. I, I like what you said. I I think and and I recently had a, a mom, a mother of teenagers, say this to me, too, or some variation. But like, you're right. They're either going to learn it, or they're going to sneak it. They're going to go around you, and and that is like from a parent perspective. Then I want to teach them. Like, because I don't want them to sneak. I know they're going to find it. I know they're going to get around it. And so, like, for a parent, I want to be proactive. I want to I want to think through those. Uh, what are the appropriate things that I want my my kids to learn that, that I can help set healthy boundaries, that I can, when this happens, not if this happens, but when this happens, what do you do in this situation? Yep. When you have somebody follow you that you don't know, when you have somebody DM you that you don't know, when you have somebody send you an inappropriate picture, it's those kind of things, like helping them have a plan and a strategy. Um, so Jeff, let's go to the other side now. How do you know when your kids are ready? How do, what are the, the mile markers that as you see, like, okay, they passed their driver's test, they're, they're earning trust, they're gaining freedom. What are those pieces? It's a, that's a really interesting question because I, 
Probably they're never ready. Like, <laughs> right. I, I don't. I mean, when you're ready to drive a car is when you've been driving one for ten years. There, there's so many. If you if you haven't, um, some of, some of the people listening to this will relate to this. But if you have never tried to teach someone to drive, so I'm on. I've done s- six kids trying to teach them how to drive so far. You do not realize how much driving is an instinct for you. So you don't realize that you are processing, you know, 500 bits of information instantaneously mm-hmm. um, and that driving is an instinct. When you go to say, say that to someone who has no instinct and you're like, look at that, look at that, see that, look through the windshield, see those brakes, see this, see that. Now, sometimes they come this way yep. and, and your kids are like, um, you know, you, you have to mm-hmm. be on the road to like, like you may, maybe you've been driving, you've sensed somebody's changing lanes on you almost. Like, it, so they're never ready. So, what you do is you protect them when they first start to drive, and then you get in the car a lot with them. Mm. And, and you have open <sighs> conversations. And, and, um, when they have questions or when they fail, you actually address those things. Mm. The thing that, that, parents and and church leaders and everybody it can't be as passive but it's relationally passive mm-hmm. and that's what happens You're like i put a filter on and then i never have to talk to my kids about porn i'm like no no no, no. no. <laughs> you have to be relationally active um and and uh because you actually can't be active enough with the technology to get to get ahead of it yeah right so I think that's the big mistake is mm. treating it like the elephant in the room. And then I think the other big mistake is when you see the kids fail, I think uh, treating them or addressing it through shame mm-hmm. is a horrible mistake. All When we look at like only gross kids look at porn, you know, that kind of thing, all that does is cause your kids never to tell you that they're struggling. Yep. So, like looking at it instead as a burden that we bear, mm-hmm. it's a it, it's a thing that I'm trying to equip you in that changes the conversation. Now, that does not mean like it's cool to like do whatever you want. Right. Uh, it doesn't mean that there there may not be consequences if that sin moves from a mistake to a right. rebellion. <laughs> right. Um. But you have you just have to be engaged with it. Mm-hmm. There's no other way around it. And then I would say that the last thing is. Um, it's if it's fascinating to me. My my kids. So Heidi and I have six children. They're all young adults or teenagers, and then we have their friends <laughs> that are. Right. And and our home is a place that people come, and I love that. Actually, I really in, enjoy that. Um, and and their friends feel um, uh, pretty free to come in and out the house. In fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zach, who is producing us right now, is one of my son's best friends. It's not uncommon for me to just find him on my couch, uh, but I love it. Like I love, I, because yeah. we, it's like an extension of family. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. what's fascinating to me is when my kids get together, they don't want to do technology. It, it amazes me how excited they get about a new board game. I'm like, really? Right. Um, and they'll do technology if we're playing Kahoot or or something like that. They'll do technology with their phones if we're playing a game together. Right. Um, but they don't want to. They're going to be bothered if like they take the time to get together and we have a gathering and everybody's like checked out on their phones. So mom and dad have to model that, mm-hmm. and you have to see that like. When you say to the kids, let's turn everything off and take a hike, let's turn everything off and play a game, let's turn it, they actually want you to say that to them. Yep. They want you to say that to them. Yep. And you're actually providing a place of respite. And mm-hmm. my, this is my little, inner, so this is just my experience. When you then create a home where that's kind of what the home does, their friends show up and they play games yeah. like literally board games yeah because this is the the phone is not a anomaly to them it's not a novelty to them it's like they need it and they want it and then they often kind of feel stuck with it and so to to 
to set a little bit of a pace that there's a different way to do this mm-hmm. without harping again because right. you need and want your phone. I, right. I have mine with me. Yeah, it's my alarm clock. It's with me 24 hours a day. Yeah. I just have the maturity. I can drive with my knee while I eat a burrito because <laughs> I've been doing it so long. If my son did that, I'd be like, "What are you doing?" You know. Kind of thing. <laughs> So it's yeah. letting it grow. And then I would say setting out that alternative. And I would say the same thing to youth pastors and church leaders. Don't harp on it. it that's dumb. Like mm-hmm. it's, a, it's like harping on electricity. Mm-hmm. Like it just, sure. it, it's going to be needed. But you can do different things. So I find it fascinating mm-hmm. in the ministry world, the return of retreats yeah. for all ages of adults is like a thing. They're like, it's something different. And we kind of want that. Yep. Um, I find it fascinating how many young adults journal with pen and paper. Yeah, it, it's the other thing. It feels different. It feels better. Yeah. Um, so just stuff like yeah, that. That's good. Um, all right. Last question on the on the church side of this. As a pastor, are there most of this? Uh, Ten years ago, you were you were having these conversations or resourcing and equipping people in your youth ministry. Now it should be in your children's ministry with your families. Yeah, like how how are you doing that in your church to to navigate these conversations? Are you guys implementing programs? Do you provide resources? What does that look like? So what we what we tend to do is try to provide, uh, like in children's ministry especially, we would try to provide alternatives. So uh, there's a term called iPad Kids that comes from the pandemic. Mom and dad working at home. Kids are stuck at home. Stay on your iPad. Um, I would say to you, mom and dad, uh, number one app uh, use app in the world is, is YouTube. If you are letting your children watch YouTube unguided, it is the it is the worst decision that you are making. YouTube is amazing. Mm-hmm. I YouTube stuff all the time, and YouTube is also a extremely dangerous tool because there's there's horrible things on YouTube. And there are predators that will cross market to your children and try to expose things to them, right? So that's right. that so letting your kid by themselves unguarded on an iPad is a horrible decision. Mm-hmm. I'm not anti iPad. What we have done then as a church is said this we create a lot of YouTube content for children. So we do it on purpose, we do it regularly, and we build out our own YouTube channel. So mom, so a kid can say, instead of can I watch, can I have my iPad, a kid might say, can I watch Power Kids? Yeah. And that can be a yes, and then they're in an ecosystem that you can set parameters up around where they're just watching their Sunday school teachers. Yep. And the, th- the great thing about YouTube is it actually doesn't have to be high quality. Right. Like it can be goofy. That, that's been a real change in the last 15 yep. years. Um, so as a church, we would do that. So if you're a church leader, um, you can create that for children. Mm. It doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be highly produced because that kid is kind of glad to see you. Yep. If I'm a youth leader, I'm probably doing the same thing, but I'm probably bringing in uh, produced content. Yep. So you probably uh, collect that content more, mm-hmm. but you can put it in a channel and say say to parents like, "This is a channel." Yep. And then I would say, as a as a youth leader, you should be a resource to a parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, in general either age-wise or via their profession, youth leaders should be closest to the cutting edge. And parents move away from it. Yep. We can't help it. And then youth leaders as a professional should stay in it. So there can be warnings, there can be cautions, there can be like, this is safe, this is not. Yeah. Um, and and it's you can be helpful in those mm-hmm. ways. The other thing I would say is this. This is to everybody. If... Um, Eric, if you saw one of my kids out in public doing something inappropriate and dangerous, what would you do as my friend with me? <laughs> I'm calling you. You're going to call me. Yeah. It's the same thing with social media. Yep. So when you see something in social media, as a friend, you're like, hey, I just... I yep. don't. I'm not going to sleep well tonight unless I know that you know about this post. Right. 
And so it that is the neighborhood. Yep. So think of that as a neighborhood. That's the neighborhood watching. It's not judgy. Yep. It's not jerk stuff. But like, if that post that your friend's kid or the kid at church made bothers you, mm-hmm. as a parent or as a friend or youth leader, like that is something you should double click on. Now, and I do this all the time. Um, I, I give you an example of this. Uh, violent school threats. Mm-hmm. My kids will pick that up on social media and they'll say, Dad, there's this thing that's going around social media about school. Every parent in high school is dealing with this right now. Yep. Uh, one of my good friends happens to be the head of our school. Mm-hmm. I text him every single time that we do that. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, I just want to make sure you know what I know. Every single time I've texted him, he's like, we know, thank you. Yep. But I'm not going to sleep well at night yep. if I'm like, I'm the guy that didn't say something. Super good. Yeah. So this, the same thing, you yeah. know, it's just friend via friend. You're not tattletaling. You're not saying like, <laughs> I think that background music was inappropriate. Right. But when a kid is like, I'm done and yep. I just am done with it all and they yep. post it yep. and you read that, you need to say, hey. Check in check in yep yeah, very good yeah thank you jeff there there's obviously uh a lot here we could probably continue this conversation but those are those are things that we want to make sure that parents especially are sensitive to aware of uh churches there are good resources for these things if you're not using like the parent Q app or access uh access.org they have things like the culture translator which is a free newsletter that sends an email to parents to help them understand culture and some of the ways that your students are getting around these things that look into those uh those are maybe low-hanging fruit opportunities to to engage your parents to even connect with them about some of these things and help provide some of those resources. So thank you, Jeff. This is a super good conversation. We appreciate your wisdom and insight on this. Uh, and, and as culture continues to change, check back in uh, with us on the Momentum Podcast because these are things that we want to keep uh, speaking into and being a resource to help you have maximum impact for God's kingdom. So, all right. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Well, guys, I think that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for listening. We'd be really honored if you went ahead and subscribed to the podcast, and that way you can just kind of stay up to date with the episodes that we're posting in the future. To learn more about Momentum Ministry Partners and our many other resources, please be sure to follow us on social media at Momentum Ministry Partners, or check out our website, www.buildmomentum.org.